If you wanted to know how Harrison Ford's life was going in 1988, in the late 60s, he starred in a film called Love. Soon after, he was in a movie called Heroes. Sounds like things are going great. Well, we're, today we're talking about him in 1988, appearing in a film called Frantic. Mm, yikes. Poor guy has paranoia to look forward to as well. Uh, this kind of dumb shit and more, this week on the Ford Fiesta. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm Adam KD63.7 Wit. And I'm Paul TK421 Preston. Later in the show, we'll be joined by one of the more entertaining people we're following on Twitter at L O N S Lons and co host of the Binge Boys podcast, Lon Harris. Very funny man. Lon's take on movies is always refreshing, usually hilarious, and often something you haven't heard before. So I'm excited to get his take on Frantic. Yeah, I'd say a film not talked about in general no. enough. So. No. We'll go in depth with Lon talking about the story, the making of, behind the scenes, and more. But first, oh. you know, this is usually where you can get a whole bunch of crazy stuff about Harrison Ford, right? If you search Harrison Ford news and nutty stuff will come up, and we've talked about it here. He, he rode a bike in Beverly Hills. And, right. Well, you know, yeah, of course. Our favorite, the Daily Mail. They go nuts. Yeah. But now he's working so much. You search and you get like legitimate a ton of legitimate stuff about Harrison interviews Ford. Interviews and, you know, He's thoughts. doing interviews all over the place. He was CBS Sunday Morning. Oh, uh, ben Mankiewicz was interviewing him there, and I think he's one of the best guys. Remember, we went to that Rocky Four screening on the anniversary oh, yeah. of it. Stallone tinkered with that film and re-edited yeah. it, and they showed it, and it was Ben interviewing him there. He's a big TCM interviewer. One right. of my favorite guys yeah. uh, out there doing stuff. He talked to Ford on CBS wow. Sunday Morning. And he was on the Playlist's Binge-Worthy podcast, talking about 1923. I mean... He's doing podcasts. He does podcasts. Yeah. Oh, so, man, we got to get him on here. Just putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen, Paul. It's just Listen, who happen. knew he'd do podcasts? Who knew he'd have a lead in a television show? But this is where we are now. And this is all stuff that's happened since we started this show. It's been a very good couple of Harrison Ford years here. And of course, his work in films is not done. Captain America New World Order is where we're going to see him debut, I believe, as oh. Thunderbolt Ross. And Shira Haas has joined. This is where I need your expertise, Adam. Right. Shira Haas has joined that film as Israeli superhero Sabra. Sabra, Sabra. I'm, have uh, they stumped you? Marvel has started stumping me big time. There's wow. some of these Marvel things. I am now coming in, you know, completely clueless. Unlike the early days where I'd recognize little, you know, I'm like, oh, that's you know, the reference to Adam Warlock or whatever. Uh, but now the obscure characters that I love are now taking center stage, which is awesome. Like Black Knight is in a movie. Now that's obscure, but I loved Black Knight. Thought he was cool. Star Fox, you know, is, is going to be uh, uh, in a movie coming up. And that's awesome. Hercules, you know, those are my C-list tier that I love. Sabra, I don't know. Maybe she's made of maggots. Oh, no, no, no. That was maggot. <laughs> in the Google Harrison Ford News, where you normally get all the Daily Mail stuff, instead there was a big article about old school male leads are back on TV. And that's, of course, okay. Ford, Costner, yeah. Stallone. Gosner. Dennis Quaid is doing another Taylor Sheridan Western, as if the guy <gasps> wasn't prolific enough. He's going to star in a, a Western. Jeff Bridges, of course, did The Old Man yeah. on FX. So, yeah, all these guys are coming to tv you know which is interesting you know i just still don't think you'll get tom cruise there but no everybody else is uh, taking a shot and seems to be working you know at yellowstone is great but tv is is no longer a uh, stigma i mean back in our days if you were on tv that was just like a, a vastly inferior medium to movie stars you know movie stars wouldn't do that sort of thing and i remember when you finally started seeing movie stars do commercials and you're like oh what, really? Mm -hmm. They're allowed to do that and not get kicked out? You know, Adrian Brody can do a Diet Coke commercial, that, you well, know, and, and yeah. <laughs> you know, not get kicked out of Hollywood for doing that? Well, I guess maybe he did, but... <laughs> but there was a wacky article when I googled Harrison Ford news. Every time Harrison Ford's chin scar was referenced in a movie. Do you know what those films are where it has been referenced? Well, we just watched Working Girl, right? Mm-hmm. That, I feel like that was the first time I heard someone say, where did you get that scar? 
you want to know why I got this scar? <laughs> that was the, feel like that was the first time someone said, oh, oh, how did you get that scar? So I would say that in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, although I'm assuming there's more. No. <laughs> so the <laughs> article, the article <laughs> decided to just do that. Just but, a working girl. And <laughs> it does feel like there are more, but this is all that the article said. And then they referenced the fact that in Solo, a Star Wars story, they put the scar onto Alden Ehrenreich's face yeah. with makeup to authenticate him being younger Harrison Ford. Right. That's funny. It's only two because I thought that when that happened, I was like, oh, a reference, an actual reference to his scar. You know, where's the scar come from? And then he gives a story. And then I thought, oh, I wonder if he'll give other story. Well, already, already we know that flies in the face of Last Crusade's claim. But uh, I was like, oh, I wonder if there's other. But no, just two, huh? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was like with a random hearts or something. Maybe there's like a romantic moment or something. Yeah. Or Devil's Own. He's telling. I don't know. But that's it, I think, according to this article, which I think was Screen Rant or one of those guys looking to fill their webpage with something. Hey, as long as they're filling it with Harrison Ford, I'm happy. There you go. By the way, before we move on, I just want to say, you know, all these guys coming to TV, this must be for new kids what it was like when we were kids and John Wayne was on something, never TV show, you know, because you didn't do that back then. But like, like old stars when we were kids, you're like, oh, that's that old star from old movies. I mean, that's Harrison Ford has got to be the John Wayne reference for younger kids right now. No, just the way I think like U2 is classic rock. I'm like, no, they just came out, didn't they? 40 years ago. Ay ay ay. Up next. This date date in Ford Ford his, history, 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 history 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 stuff to do on Zoom. <laughs> Very. <laughs> What's going on in on this date in Ford history? Well, we're recording here in January. Who knows when you'll hear it? But <laughs> January 20th, 2002. Harrison Ford wins this Cecil, 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 let's go Cecil, Cecil Cecil B. DeMille Award, which I believe is like your Thalberg Award career achievement thing for the Golden Globes. Yeah, you're not going to win an Oscar. Here's the thing. Yeah, right. They they gave one to Eddie Murphy this year for the same reason. Thanks for saving Hollywood many times over. Sorry we never gave you any credit for that (laughs) besides box office money. Here's the thing. Yeah, of course, much deserved. He also has the AFI life achievement, and he got that like 20 years ago. Still cranking out legendary stuff. But uh, yeah, absolutely deserved. So good for him on that. I mean, who can compare to him? He should have all the awards. I mean, you look at what we've just gone through. We're going in order of his career. And you look at what he he just did for pop culture. I mean, creating Han Solo and Indiana Jones in... Uh, three years time you know like it's just like oh uh, what, what are your characters you're responsible for oh well i'm uh elvis presley marilyn monroe and uh, james dean do you like those three you know it's like huge absolutely and yeah. then he goes into these movies or which are a whole other experience just continues to be epic you know yeah well they did nominate him for the oscar for witness but um yeah the fugitive should have got an oscar nomination you, you know yeah underplaying deserves reward and of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark, in my opinion, it is for just being a Hollywood god. You know, yeah. like you're like that's what they're going to give it to Tom Cruise. They're going to be like, "Congratulations, you've been a Hollywood god for this long. Here's your Oscar." Yeah, and he got close a couple times. I thought his best shot was Jerry Maguire, also nominated, I believe, for Born on the Fourth of July and Magnolia. So he's had a few shots, but you can only be so awesome. It's time yeah. to recognize it. You know. Well, and also, you know, people don't go go back and do what they used to, which is like, you know, Tom Cruise would be in all these movies we love, like, oh, Mission Impossible. And then he'll be in like some movie where he's, you know, got an ailment and, you know, and you're just like, that is not a Tom Cruise movie at all. (laughs) And you're like, just going for the Oscar. They don't do that anymore. So he's like, I ain't going for an Oscar. You either give it to me for Top Gun Maverick. You know, I'm not going to go play a bubble boy or something the you know? next two movies are mission impossible <laughs> movies yeah screw you yeah no, he's, he's not going and getting an incurable ailment so that he can you know <laughs> pass away in a bed and therefore get an oscar no. january 22nd 2010 extraordinary measures is released ah. i saw it years later on a plane but i did finally see it and it might be a good time to go check it out because you know the Fraser Sots is a or Fraser, I should say. Oh, right, the Fraser Sots. The Sons. Fraser yeah. Sots is underway with Brendan Fraser's performance in The Whale. So, or is it a Brendan Sots? 
Brendenaissance. That's not bad. Brendenaissance. That rolls like off the that. tongue. Yeah, Brendenaissance. <laughs> yeah. So be a part of it. Watch Extraordinary Measures with Harrison Ford doing the trying to heal a deadly be- disease thing. Okay. Maybe win an Oscar. But it came out in January, so there wasn't a lot of faith. No. they were. Well, <laughs> you know, and the ones that come out in January, sometimes they're the ones that were being prepped for an Oscar push. And then they're just like. It ain't going to make the I ain't going to compete with all the crap coming out in November and December. We'll just release it in January. There's always some of those in January. January and February are like a horror movie, it's, you know, totally like things for genre fans, and then like movies that clearly should have been nominated or wanted to be nominated for Oscars, but they decided not to get in that biz and, the, you know, put something serious out in January for the for the parents. Well, enough of this nonsense. We have entirely different nonsense to attend to. And that would be our patented Movie Guys recap of Frantic. Let's do it. The Ford Fiesta podcast has committed itself to documenting every first in Harrison Ford's career. We've documented the first time he played a hippie. Hi. Uh. His feature film debut as a police officer. Pull over, I'll shoot out your tires. And we were excited to highlight his many hillbillies. Willie Bill was born in Pecos. 18 summers he has seen. But with today's movie, Harrison Ford achieves a new milestone as he plays his very first doctor in a movie with a deliciously simple title, Frantic. Not only that, Frantic marks the first time Harrison Ford plays a doctor named Richard whose wife is harmed under mysterious circumstances. But not the last. Richard! In his third film in Harrison Ford Phase 3, Ford continues to avoid being typecast as a hunky stud. Good luck. And continues to expand his acting craft by not relying on his acting crutch of performing opposite a big dog. And in Frantic, Harrison Ford chooses another director with a European art film sensibility to bring out something new in his performance and ensure a different feel to the movie. Here he trades underrated master of suspense Peter Weir for rated master of suspense Roman Polanski, director of Chinatown, Rosemary's Baby, and The Pianist. What'd you say there? The Pianist? <laughs> in Frantic, Harrison Ford plays... Dr. Richard Walker. And that's exactly who this movie is about. Walker is a surgeon traveling with his wife, Sandra, for a medical conference in France, where it's traditionally held because that's the only country Roman Polanski is allowed to shoot in. But on the way back from the airport, they get a flat tire. But it's dismissed almost instantly as just another daily hassle. Because, to set the tone, in Frantic, Polanski first chooses to bore us with the banality of taking a taxi to Paris. (laughs) Why? Because Paris is airports and cabs at first. And that's Richard Walker's point of view. Polanski focuses on the dull rhythm of getting to a hotel. Even the Eiffel Tower, robbed of its majesty, revealed by a garbage truck pulling away from the traffic jam it caused. At their hotel, Sandra is unable to unlock her suitcase, and Walker determines that she picked up the wrong one at the airport, and that someone else has their bag. (laughs) Eh, nope. Just another dumb thing. Must have just picked up the wrong bag at the airport. Very exciting. As a luggage problem. Sandra unpacks while Walker takes a shower. Clip may have been modified. As we slowly <laughs> zoom into the empty doorway, Sandra receives a phone call off screen. And we never see what happens to her, leaving us, in her husband's clueless point of view, ratcheting up the slow boil tension as the jet-lagged Walker sleepily comes to recognize that he should be worried. Walker tries communicating this to the staff and French authorities, but the language barrier and general French indifference to rushing about thwarts his early attempts to find out what's happening. It's like those French have a different word for everything. If the Mosquito Coast was the most acting Harrison Ford has done to this point, then Frantic is the most reacting Harrison Ford has done in his career. The emotion promised by the title Frantic can only be fulfilled by Harrison Ford's face as he becomes more and more desperate for the entire runtime of the movie. 
A wino overhears him in a cafe and says he saw Sandra being forced into a car in a nearby alley. Walker is skeptical until he finds his wife's ID bracelet on the cobblestones. He's getting agitated, angry, delirious, and distraught. One could even say, frantic! He contacts the Paris police and the U.S. Embassy and tells them, I didn't kill my wife! but is again met with French bureaucratic indifference and smoking, and there is little hope anyone will bother looking for Sandra. So Walker takes it upon himself to investigate, starting from zero. But thanks to a smart bit of casting, the audience has no doubt that Harrison Ford is capable of getting to the bottom of this case, find the bad guy, and punch the bastard. It occurs to Walker that the suitcase, mistakenly given to Sandra, may offer some clues if the other suitcase is connected to her disappearance. What he finds at first appears to be nothing. Souvenir Statue of Liberty, a keychain with a blue parrot on it, and then a matchbook with the same blue parrot! <laughs> eh, not really, but close! Because inside the matchbook is the name of a woman, Dee Dee, and her phone number. I don't know if younger viewers know this, but matchbook covers was where we stored phone numbers before there were cell phones. The matchbook leads him to the Blue Parrot, where he gets some information about this Dee Dee, leading him to an apartment where he finds a murder. Walker finds that his room has been tossed and goes back to the murder scene to await the return of the owner to the apartment, which turns out to be the streetwise Michelle, played by Emmanuel Sanger, who he meets the same way Roman Polanski did, by being unable to leave France. <laughs> Michelle mistook Sandra's suitcase for her own at the airport because they look alike. We have the exact same briefcase. But Michelle was picking up the suitcase because she was smuggling something in it for some shady dealers. And this must be the men behind the kidnapping. Walker tries to return her suitcase to the crime scene through a rooftop skylight, which turns into a dizzying suspense sequence as he almost falls to his death and spills the contents of the suitcase all over the roof, and Lady Liberty tumbles to the ground, breaking open, revealing something inside. We will come to find out that it contains not drugs, but a Kryton, which can be used to write the novel Sphere or as a detonator for nuclear weapons. Which means Walker's wife wasn't kidnapped by petty criminals for drugs, but international criminals with ties to the Middle East, Israel, and CIA intelligence operations. Okay, now we're in a Harrison Ford movie. Yep! Michelle and Walker's relationship winds through her crazy life, but never plays Walker being a fish out of water for anything more than the winding suspense of his alienation. He's a stalwart married man looking for his missing wife, never enjoying the sexy subterfuges or drugs at dance clubs that the two must engage in as they navigate the various players of the underworld. The American Embassy, led by John Mahoney, are working with Israeli agents to get the device back, and they have no problem letting Sandra die for it, making Walker wild and distraught with fear, anxiety, or emotion, conducting himself in a hurried, excited, and chaotic way because of the need to act quickly. You know, Paul, there's an easier way to say that. Frantic! Michelle is more interested in getting her money back, but Walker's goals suit hers, and so they set up an exchange by a one-third scale Statue of Liberty in a bay in France. If you're catching that the bulk of the symbolism this movie centers around the Statue of Liberty, good job. But it's even more striking that in a city with an Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty outdoes that monument in screen time by about 20 to 1. Finally, Walker sees his wife. My wife first! But at the moment of the exchange, Michelle demands her money and becomes a hostage in the hands of the bad guys. Right about now, Harrison Ford fans are asking themselves, how frantic can this guy get before he punches somebody? Well, about this frantic. The great thing about Harrison Ford's three divergences from the pulp films that made him a legend is no matter how quiet he gets or how beaten he is, we know each character he plays can punch a guy. We quietly root for it, and then finally, he delivers it victoriously. Minutes before the end of Frantic, when Harrison Ford finally punches the bad guy, it feels as good as any punch in Temple of Doom. Except the one that sends that thuggy sliding like 15 feet along the ground. That's a great punch. That, that's a great punch. As they hold a gun to Michelle's head, Harrison Ford sneaks up behind the terrorist kidnapper and jumps him, adding two Harrison Ford specials on the guy's jaw. Yeah. But in the scuffle, Michelle has been shot. And this is where Harrison Ford pulls out another specialty and with righteous anger, throws the Kryton into the river. Never to be found. Unless they look for it later. Not sure if they look for it later. Yeah. And the movie ends with husband and wife reunited, driving down the most beautiful street in Paris with a perfectly centered Eiffel Tower at sunset magic hour. The city in this movie is finally beautiful. 
And that's Frantic, Ta-da! everybody. That's, that's the movie. Frantic. That's the movie Frantic. We just told you the movie Frantic is what we There it is. There it is. It's, it's, it's got a lot with, of lug- luggage problems. With dopey jokes, yeah, and flat tires. Let's talk about it, and to do so, we've taken another request, as I do believe he reached out to us to talk about this one. Our friend from the movie Trivia Schmodown, fellow podcaster and writer for Screen Junkies, if I'm not mistaken, is his credits are vast and varied, so I want to make sure I get the right place, for because he's, many, he, you'll many, find him all over them. the internet. And may I recommend following him on Twitter at oh, Lons, yes. L-O-N-S, because, I mean, for my money... There's plenty of people out there who give you their opinion about uh, movies. What I kind of get from Lon is he gives opinions about people who give opinions about movies. I could be right or wrong about that. I'll let him explain it. It's Lon Harris, everybody. I think that's very fair. There's like historiography, or they call it, where it's like the study of historians and how we talk about history. I guess it's sort of that. It's like the study of like all you dopes and how you're wrong about everything. (laughs) <laughs> I've always wanted to do a show that ostensibly from the title is, you know, critics, movie critics, but all you're doing is critiquing other people's criticisms of movies. <laughs> you're like, all right, is... here's some of the criticism of Avatar this week. Look what this asshole yeah, has. Yeah, you said. kind of inevitably end up there, I think, on some level. It's hard to just purely talk about the, the thing you're talking about and not the discourse, you know, like that, especially now that social media and like the discourse is just part of it. Like, I don't know how to e- extricate those two things. It's nice to go back and watch something like Frantic because it's removed from all. Nobody's discussing it. You can go in and just be like, I'm going to react to this organically. But how do you do that with like Glass Onion and everybody's watching it all at once and we're all yelling about it at each other in real time? I don't know. (laughs) The first to get on the Internet to know nothing about Glass Onion is often the contest. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Let me say, Lon also definitely follow him on Twitter because he's very sanity making for me because I don't follow a whole bunch of politics. I'd rather hear what Lon thinks about what's uh-huh. going on in politics. And oh that's enough for me. It's and it's so he, it's a genuine public service that Lon <laughs> does to, to go, here's what this asshole said. And then I just talked to Lon about it. I don't even, yeah. I don't even go to that guy's Twitter or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good, like 95% of my tweets are like, here's what this asshole said. And I try, like, it's not intentional. I don't go, Go on to Twitter with that as my goal. No. I'm like, I'm going to talk about it. But it's there. It's I almost Twitter's watched. purpose. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you just get you get caught up in that. It's impossible. All right. And the question I had for Lon was, tell us about your Harrison Ford journey. What's the first thing you saw Harrison Ford in? What's the first thing that you were like, oh, this guy's great, you know, because he really yeah. starts building up a, a, quite a career. I mean, we're, we're still in the height of it. But uh, I think it was, I was only really into comedy as a kid. Now I stand before you with just a movie fan and I like everything. Okay. But for the first 10, 12 years of my life, I really just was into, I didn't care, like even Star Wars, like I saw it at a friend's birthday party, but Uh it wasn't like a movie that was top of mind for me. I love like the Saturday Night Live guys and John Candy and Rick Moranis and like that was my, that, those were the movies I was interested in. So the one thing I knew and loved Harrison Ford from as a kid was the Frisco Kid with him. Uh, Really? that comedy western with him and Gene Wilder because I loved Gene wow. Wilder as a kid because oh, I love yeah. goofy, crazy comedy. And even like Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor movies I thought were like hilarious and like, ooh, you're not supposed to watch that stuff. So <laughs> Gene, I would watch anything with Gene Wilder. So that comedy western Frisco oh, kid that he wow. did with Harrison Ford was my first introduction. And then by the time I was like 10, 12, 13, that was when I got into Star Wars and Indiana Jones and some of the bigger franchise stuff that we all think of as being like, Harrison Ford movies and then by you know the 90s when I was already into movies it was like obviously I loved all of that tentpole stuff you know Fugitive and and that whole era but you must be one of the very few people that's like hey it's that guy from Frisco Kid yeah for the for all for for my (laughs) throughout my childhood he would have really been that guy from from the Frisco like but way before he was Han Solo because I didn't care like I just I don't know something something about sci-fi if it wasn't funny it just wasn't my wavelength as a young person like i was just purely interested in monty python and Saturday Night live and sketch yeah. comedy and that kind of stuff like my brother and i would watch every steve martin and bill murray movie oh. but not every harrison ford movie yeah did, did you see blazing saddles yet because it's like i could see frisco kid going oh it's the guy from blazing saddles yeah i'm in you know yeah. he would have been the guy from wonka and yeah. blazing saddles and probably like 
you know, I probably saw a bunch of dumb Gene Wilder stuff as a kid just because my parents would, like, I probably watched Haunted Honeymoon at age oh, seven yeah. or eight just because <laughs> nobody was watching me to be like, you don't need to see that. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, I definitely would have loved Mel Brooks already by that point. Right. Here's something sure. interesting. The other day I saw, for the first time ever, the highest ranked movie on the AFI Top 100 that I hadn't seen. So now it's City Lights. But before mm. I saw this film, it was High Noon. So I watched sure. High Noon for the first time, and Blazing Saddles just got a ton funnier. <laughs> like, I already knew it was funny, but I yeah. had no idea, like, the direct hits that. to High Noon, that movie was pulling from the oh, song yeah. to the, the mob, the townspeople. That mentality is, is in High Noon, you know, where they're all debating, what do we do? Because, oh, Frank Miller's coming on the train, and he's going to Yeah, get, we're, we're, right. we're all like, Vernon Johnson is right about Mabel Johnson being right. That's it. Like, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff is High Noon, and I wasn't aware. You know, I totally bought it with Blazing Saddles. It's a great dynamic to have dumb mob mentality in the middle of their Western. And I just thought that was awesome. Yeah, Mel Brooks is so good at pulling, like, those the real, like, lived-in specifics from the things he's parodying. Not just, like, the, the big genre stuff, but, like, the little details, you know, the individual scenes and moments. Yeah. Well, uh, here's an awkward transition. He's a legend. So is Roman Polanski. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> for many things. <laughs> yeah, listen, it's, it. a, it's, a, it's a long and story tale. A lot of ups, a lot of downs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why did they shoot? So, are, are you getting around to why they shot in France? Because it was an interesting mm. uh, place to shoot, I feel, for this movie. Why do you think Polanski chose to shoot there? Yeah, I wonder why that was. <laughs> I have to look into it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the film comes out in 1988, so we're up to 88. Or I think Dead Heat and Mary Ground was 66, so it's actually 22 years into Harrison Ford's wow. career. Comes out March 30th in France, so I thought that was interesting that it came out later in France than it did in the States, but nevertheless. Uh, it goes out there, tries to make some money, and domestically, on a $20 million budget, it earned $17.6 Now, these aren't mm. indie and Star Wars numbers for no. Harrison Ford. And it's interesting because you look at Box Office Mojo or Wikipedia, you know, where I go to get this stuff, there's no international markets listed. But reports do say it did better in France, where over a million people saw it, which would give it another seven, probably back then, another five seven million movies were 50 cents back then or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like three <laughs> fifty four bucks i think top gun was the first five dollar movie i went to so then up and up oh, yeah so yeah not a big hit for harrison you know part of the risk he was taken in this post blockbusters section of his career you're calling it phase what three adam this is phase three phase there's three, the yeah. unknown ford up until you know star wars and you know you maybe even could put that in phase one just because he was kind of an unknown quantity there but yeah that whole 80s run is phase two and then as of witness where he's deliberately trying to make movies that don't make money i mean I, that's kind of his intent is like i don't want to be this big box office star i want to expand my horizons and these three in a row man what an expansion the choices he made in these three roles from witness mosquito coast and this are fascinating phase three is amazing they're great yeah. too yeah this is not an ensemble piece in terms of the like the box office like he's it, no. this movie is the draw is it's a harrison ford movie nobody else in this is really like a notable star there it's not an action film even polanski yeah. at this point in his career was not like a draw at that like this was really like it's a Harrison Ford vehicle in every way. Like more than even, you know, even the other two movies he did that are kind of trying to break away, like Witness. It's not an ensemble. He's definitely the lead, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. You spend a right. lot of time with other people. But this one, he is front and center. And that is actually the concept is he's so alone. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's about his like he's, his alienation. He's like suspended yeah. in this foreign environment. and No one will help him. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about Polanski in a second, but let's just talk about the director of this movie. Let's just talk about the direction of this movie. It's amazing how much suspense has gotten out of the banality of just even traffic or, uh, a, you know, a, a, a blown tire or just trying to scale a roof at one point is just turned into a giant Hitchcockian scene. And I'm just amazed at like the, the banality, uh, how that yielded so much suspense. The, the emphasis really, like, and, and, you know, sort of later in the 90s as, as Harrison Ford became more like a superhero, even something like The Fugitive, where he's also playing a 
doctor, you know, he's not like, like in Air Force One, they give him like he was a military pilot, like he's prepared <laughs> for this. But like in The Fugitive and this, he's just, you know, he's a regular guy and and even more so here than The Fugitive. The Fugitive, he's already like mostly Dom Toretto, like he's jumping off things in between, like he's a, he's a, he's a capable action star. And this one, I really like that they repeatedly emphasize like, He's awkward. He's not prepared for this. He's jet lagged and tired and he's sort of out of it. And there are a lot of sequences that are built on like an action star would just run across that roof. But yeah. if you were a normal middle-aged dude trying to navigate this roof with a suitcase, it probably wouldn't go that well. Right. And absolutely. Yeah, I, love, I feel like that's a big part of like the hook that makes this work is that you're really like, oh, this guy's a clod. He's not going to be able to do this. And the great thing about this and, you know, Mosquito Coast and Witness as well is that he's still Harrison Ford. So we know in like at some point he's going to blow up. Like This is going to like he, we know at some point he can handle himself. So there's so much fun waiting for him to go. Oh, man, just punch somebody already. They're just, you know, like the <laughs> all the crap they're putting him through. I'm like, just shout with some righteous anger or point at somebody, man. I know you got it in you, but like we wait and we wait and we wait. And it's yeah. really satisfying when he finally goes full forward, I believe we, we could say. <laughs> There's like that climactic <laughs> shot where we see and play, like one of the things Polanski does in this film that's so good is he uses the background so cleverly. He's always showing you things going on in the foreground and characters not looking behind them, but we can see trouble yes. coming in the distance and he's got that shot where it's uh the bad guy is strangling someone in the foreground they're not looking and he sneaks up behind them and does one of his like vintage four jumps you know where he like yes. i'm gonna jump into this guy and take him out and we watch the whole thing in the planning stages of the bad guy doesn't know what's coming it is very satisfying Oh, yeah. I'm going to pull that clip. We're going to watch that yeah, in a second a, here. It's, but, he's got uh, this patented, like, I'm going to leap into the bad guy and thereby take him out. That like It's like a vintage Ford move he does in a bunch of yep, movies. Jack Ryan does yes. a, a plenty. Yeah, it's, yeah a Jack, it's a Jack Ryan move for sure. Where it's like, I'm not, I'm not a badass, but I'm like, I'm badass enough to jump at you. Yeah, it, it, it is a classic Ford jump with the two arms. And, right, and uh, it's just because he's yeah. using, like, the... It's, it's not, he's not, like assaulting the guy he's like using the power of his own body to just like I, it's a desperation play you know <laughs> yeah yeah and that's great and that's what we build up to i mean when he punches that guy it is so satisfying <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's coiled he's 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 pent up he's like anxious yeah. and looking around he's frantic for the whole movie so we're kind of yeah. just waiting for that energy release and it finally comes yeah yeah so, yeah, we talked about how the whole movie's about him, yet there is a low sign of confidence to put this out in February. Am I right? I, I tried to look to see if maybe it was pushed from the holidays or something, you know, but because uh, Mosquito Coast was 86, 87 was nothing from Ford. Like can timing or something? Was this play at Cannes Film Festival or something? That February timing, maybe that's for some sort of festival type thing? I don't know, because it's not for the Oscars. It can would be May. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and because of that, it's not a big Memorial Day thing and it doesn't make the money. Lon, do you remember the first time you saw the movie? It was in college, actually. As an undergrad, I took a UCLA film class that was five sort of random filmmakers together. It was Orson Welles, Max Ophels, Joseph Losey, wow. Stanley Kubrick, and then Roman Polanski. And so we watched every Polanski movie, basically. Oh, this wow. had just randomly gotten by me at that point. I hadn't seen it just because of the Harrison Ford connection. So I saw this the first time, like, projected at UCLA at the James Bridges Theater. Oh, nice. The James Bridges Theater. Yeah, the, the UCLA on-campus screening room that you use when you're in film classes is named after James Bridges because he was oh, a, cool. a noted UCLA film school alum. Yeah. Director of Perfect. Did that guy put out enough movies, James Bridges? Oh. What did he put out? An Urban Cowboy? Was he Bright Lights, Big City? Was that him? Yeah. It's a handful, but they're memorable. Yeah, and they're all written and directed. I just heard, you know, this summer when Quentin Tarantino put out Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, when he put that out, he went on a bunch of different shows, and man, he just went on this whole thing about James Bridges, and the same month they were shown a James Bridges festival at the New Beverly. I never really even knew anything about James Bridges, but he's a huge fan, and he's a writer-director, too, so yeah. yeah. He's an auteur. Adam, you saw this in the theater, or did you not see this in the theater? Where does that fall in your timeline? Did not see this in the theater. This would be shortly after we got a VCR, and I could finally start seeing some things that I had missed. I don't know if I would have 
I guess I would have wanted to go to the theater. I wanted to go to the theater to see everything Harrison Ford. This one, though, might have been hard to catch or maybe just wasn't the sort of thing my dad was like, yeah, let's go see Roman Polanski's Frantic. I don't know about that. So I did see this on video, and I remember very much watching it, and the whole crowd that was there, we had the one VCR amongst a group of friends, so like it was movie nights at our place or whatever, and this one really played. Like I remember just the sort of like, Everybody being like way into the suspense of this and stuff. And like, you know, everybody loved it afterwards, talked about it a lot. So, and it's been since then, since I saw it, this is the second time I've ever seen Frantic. So this was cool. I saw it in the theater uh, as I did everything from Empire Strikes Back on. That's amazing. Except for Blade Runner, which I wasn't old enough to see. But I saw Empire in the Theater, Raiders, and then Jedi, Doom. When I was 18, I had Mosquito Coast and Frantic posters in... The better. I worked at a movie theater, so I'd bring this stuff home. I still have those posters, still got a Witness poster, still got a Last Crusade poster, and on and on and on. So, yeah, I collect posters, and there's no shortage of Ford in my garage. All we knew at that point when we were decorating our rooms and dorm rooms and whatnot was the Lord hates space that is not covered yeah. in poster. You got to collage it as best you can. Yeah. Yes. Now you got all this classy crap going on. You got some negative space or frames. whatever. That's not, you got to put that's frames not how that on things. <laughs> it's not how that worked back then. No. I got to be honest with you. I don't like the idea of putting frames on everything. I, I think we should all go back to college. Come on. What, how, how much are we paying for all these posters? We got to frame. Oh, I know. Everything. I love it. I, I mean, I'm like, yeah, I, I should absolutely cover every inch of my wall like I did it's, before. Well, I, that, that should never go out of style. You, like, adult department should just look like that. You a fun tech guy, Lon? <laughs> fun what? tack. Fun tack. Yeah, oh, is that like tack? Right, yeah. It's the no. sticky goop you put behind it so you don't put a tack through it. It's the... No, I I, stuff right. I wasn't allowed. As a child, my mom was very, like, neat freak, fastidious, and I wasn't allowed. I didn't have anything up on my walls as a kid. I had oh, bare yeah. walls. You couldn't put holes in the wall, any of that stuff. Any image I picked out which she wouldn't have liked, it would have clashed with the pattern of this thing or that thing. It was just not. That was her domain. I just slept there, so... Uh. <laughs> The great thing about PlastiTac was you could put it up on your wall and slowly watch your poster slowly slide yeah. down the wall and fall off the PlastiTac <laughs> over the course of about three or four weeks, and then you had to redo it again. Sure. <laughs> well, let's go back to the story, which we touched on. Uh, you know, We covered the whole recap, but thoughts on it, because I tried to run errands this last weekend, and it didn't go well. I, I know I picked the wrong weekend to do it, but people would be closed on New Year's Day, perhaps. People are closed today the day after new year's people closed saturday and then people some people were closed on friday because with the holiday falling on the weekend people were just picking random days to take off from work so i couldn't get a lot of stuff done and so then i watched frantic i'm like watching this guy not get stuff done i think i was in a bad <laughs> space but i was super nervous this whole movie i was like i couldn't handle it when the even when he leaves the bathroom and the paper just in furls practically follows him out the bathroom and he kind of swats it off i'm like that would have happened to me today Nothing was going right. You know, I needed to Miyagi the day where you clap your hands and you shake them together and it just resets everything. Gets Daniel from Stop Complaining. Yeah, there's a certain kind of element in a story like this where it's like adding complications. You got to add complications so that the problem isn't too easy to solve. You know, you got to get a movie out of it. But it's very hard to do that and make it feel like organic. I feel like a lot of movies where they start throwing stuff at the hero, you you feel the hand of the writer behind it. Like, well, right. it's the second act. This guy's got to betray them or this person has to see, you know, and like you see all those threads coming in. This movie, I think, is very good about throwing stuff in Harrison Ford's way that he didn't see coming, that, that the movie wasn't necessarily preparing you for, that makes it more difficult. But it doesn't feel like a writer is throwing stuff at him. It feels like it's organically coming from the situation and that they just thought out all the different threads, like the Israeli agents who are also after him or the fact that, yeah, he spilled the stuff from the suitcase on the roof. And so even if he stashes it there and goes inside, he's got to eventually get back onto the roof and get that, you know, like, and like stuff yeah. like no. that. I feel like the Breaking Bad shows, <laughs> Vince Gilligan is also really good at this. And you could like, people who are really good at that stand out because so few writers are actually really good at it. It's so much more directed than written because it's incredibly simple in some ways. But like, even at the very beginning, when he doesn't even know his wife has been kidnapped, like he just assumes, oh, I don't know, she went down to the lobby or whatever, and then right. he he falls asleep on the couch, and we're screaming. All he did was fall asleep on the couch, and <laughs> as an audience, we're screaming, going, 
dude, your wife has been kidnapped. Get <laughs> wet, get up, get up. And then the guy yeah. comes to the door and he doesn't realize he's kind of piecing it together, all this stuff. And then he goes down the lobby. And you talked about earlier about the backgrounds in this movie that Polanski does a couple amazing things here. One is to shoot with a, I believe like a 20 millimeter, 17 millimeter lens so that anything up front is very close to us and everything else is sort of shifted to the background. And also that's a wide angle lens. So you see everything in the background. So when he's walking through the lobby of that hotel, well, that's actually a wide shot, but it's so populated. He's got to go through so many people and bump into yeah. so many people. And there's just something gets so suspenseful about that. And it's kind of like the ethic of this whole movie of just like the complicated, the background of the separation of him. It's really, really well directed. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's amazingly directed. I mean, like that's one of the things Polanski brought to a lot of these thrillers is that they're always about alienated protagonists. For whatever reason, they can't communicate with people. Nobody's helping them. They always find themselves sort of isolated and alone in these scenarios. Uh, Repulsion is like the classic example where it's Catherine Deneuve and she's traumatized and she's being haunted by unseen figures and nobody will believe her. And it's like that kind of thing. And yeah, the way he shoots it, he isolates forward in the frame he's obviously there's a language barrier that a lot of oh, scenes are yeah. built around where he can't directly communicate nobody's listening to him and nobody's listening the, to him and even the version of paris like we usually think of paris as it's always romanticized in oh, movies yeah. it's always glamorous it's the city of light <laughs> you know like it's always this this romantic beautiful destination and he makes paris look so gross and yes. ugly and awful and urban it's all like alleys and dirty apartment buildings and there's you don't get a single beautiful shot of no. like a Paris square with a bistro and like nothing that we're used to seeing from movies. It's all grunge Paris. Right. And <laughs> the best thing is the very first shot of the Eiffel Tower is revealed from a garbage truck that has delayed them for the third time from the airport. They've been delayed and delayed yeah. and delayed. It's and so the, good. The, finally, the garbage truck that's delayed them <laughs> pulls away and there's the Eiffel the Tower. Eiffel You're Tower. like, oh my yeah. God, a garbage <laughs> truck just revealed it. Yeah. It's so great. And uh, I love when movies, any movie that like they show you that, like the reverse of the, the location that you're used to seeing. Like it's like, uh, it's so fun when like Michael Mann makes an LA movie and it's like, oh, we're going to see actual LA and not Hollywood Boulevard. And then we'll pretend that that that's what Los Angeles is. Right. Like. Yeah. Well, and also the Statue of Liberty that pops up all over the place here. Obviously, this thematically, I mean, there must be 50 shots, uh, either the little statue, which ultimately becomes the MacGuffin and right. that fake Statue of Liberty that's on the river or in the bay or something like that. There must be 50 shots of that thing, <laughs> you know. And that's a weird choice. I was going to bring yeah. this up anyway, because the whole movie. Shouldn't it be an Eiffel Tower? <laughs> it'll be a Golden Gate Bridge. The whole movie, we're, yeah. we're told it's all San Francisco. He's from San Francisco. That's where she was visiting. She's even got an I heart San Francisco button on the hat that she's oh, wearing. Oh, okay. Really? Yeah. So why is it a <laughs> Statue of Liberty? It should be a Golden Gate. Like, it's, it's a specific choice. And that, this is what I was going to get into. I think a lot of this movie is also about Europeans versus Americans and like the culture clash of how Europeans and Americans are very culturally different and approach these things differently. So I guess it was that, that that's the connection between France and America is the Statue of Liberty. But it feels pretty strongly to me like it should be Fisherman's Wharf or something. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's uh, obviously we're left to symbolism. There's some sort of symbolism, obviously, to that because it's quite stuck in there. And well, obviously, yeah. France gave us the statue so, of right. Liberty. Right. That was a gift from France. So you're talking yeah. about that cultural exchange and, and like the <laughs> the iconic symbol of America. If you were just going to pick one landmark to stand in for the U.S., it's also interesting. How did they get the the MacGuffin? In this case, is like a detonator, a nuclear detonator. Right. That's somehow been encased. I, I, unclear how the terrorists managed to encase a detonator within a plaster <laughs> Statue of Liberty. You, it looks like you would need a special facility to make something like that. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't have broken open a souvenir, put it in there, and then glued it back together. It's a whole souvenir. Yeah. He, he's knocking on it. He can't figure out how to open it. It's true. And they have to knock it off the roof to Yeah, what do they have? Know, a, they have a 3D printer in 1988 uh, <laughs> San Francisco? How do they make this? He's saying this is not very realistic, Lon. I, it's all, because you're like, wait, wait, so it's inside this plaster statue? Like, they kind of almost prompt you to wonder how it came to be. But It's interesting. I never thought of that. I just figured that's what bad guys do. 
Yeah. <laughs> they take the detonator they have to hide, and then they dip it in some sort of mold that forms a plastic <laughs> right. Statue of Liberty around it, because that's there's no bomb-sniffing dogs that are going to look in there. Yeah. You know, cocaine's got to go in a teddy bear. It's like there's all these, uh, you know, sort of things. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned Emmanuel. I've been saying Sainer, but it's probably Maybe. Sainier or something. I don't, just your, your guess is as good as French mine. French Sainier. Sainier. So she was uh, a model and Polanski's girlfriend, and uh, he actually married her after this in, in 1989, I believe. She would have been 23. This tracks for Polanski, mm-hmm. right? Can, uh, sure, um, sure, yeah. Uh, par for the Polanski <laughs> sure. course. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, sure. But she's still working. So she was uh, in at Eternity's Gate with Willem Dafoe just recently. She's beautiful. They are, they're still married, I believe, are they not? And are they're they? still married, they yeah. So yeah. everything worked out of that coming together for this movie. Yeah, she's in his most recent film, the, the one um, I'm looking at. Uh, an Officer and a Spy. It, did, it never even came out. It's about the Dreyfus Affair, a very famous oh. historical incident of anti-Semitism in French history. I believe she's one of the stars of it. Oh. Gotcha. She found herself in the Ninth Gate as well in Bitter mm, Moon. That's right. Yeah. She's in, yes, she is in the Ninth Oh, yeah, Bitter Moon. That's right. Yeah, yeah, a bunch. she's in a bunch of the later stuff. Yeah. But I think we're all Harrison Ford when he tells her, my wife, goddammit, like after oh, yeah. he can't get her to focus on why he's even with her. You know, like, yeah. this is all about getting my wife. And she's like, but what about the money? And I need the, blah, blah, blah. you know, and, she's like, and, and I have to find her. Who do you have to find her? My wife. I think he just uh, yeah. comes to full. Good, good shot. It's a recurring thing in the movie that like, and that is what I'm saying about like Americans versus the friend or European, like this sensibility is they're, they're so cavalier about the fact that his wife is missing in France. And, and it's depicted as everywhere he goes, every French person he tells about it immediately is like, well, you are in Paris. She is having an it's affair. It, you know, she is cheating on you with young man. You know, like every single to the point of almost it being comical. And so I feel like we're building for a lot of the movie to him just finally being like, we're talking about my wife. I know. <laughs> exactly. And it's so satisfying. Yeah. Slow yeah. boil Harrison Ford. And also Mosquito Coast is the most acting Harrison Ford has done so far in his career. This is the most reacting he's done so far and what an interesting challenge if you're in Harrison Ford's head and you've done Star Wars Indiana Jones you want to separate yourself from that sure he plays a cop and witness very different type very different you know slower type of story the most talking he's ever done is Mosquito Coast and then for the the third one of these sort of alternate like now he's got to find his acting career for this to be just so much reacting just his face really cool what a great new choice uh, for third choice in phase three you know and we almost didn't get it considered here uh, kevin costner nick nolte <gasps> and william hurt uh were considered Ooh. you know i don't know how far along they got oh it's a very different movie with william hurt because i think of him as somebody who's so like cerebral you don't think of him as like diving to take a guy out in the background to get the detonator from him so i feel yeah. like that plays very differently if you put william hurt in the same part yeah, Costner probably could have done it. Nick Dolte would have been interesting. I ain't got yeah. my wife, guy damn it. Yeah, I feel like Dolte would be like the most similar to this, where he'd probably have a Ford kind yeah. of vibe to it. Yeah. Costner would have worked. Yeah. Another thing Ford does acting wise of this that I think is really good is he's very good at the like the code switch moments where he's like in a panic and he's like yelling at people and he's like, We're gonna find my wife, we're gonna do this. And then somebody who recognizes him as a surgeon will see him, like David Huddleston for the Big Lebowski. There's a big scene where yeah, he comes over. I noticed that. And Blazing Saddles. Yeah, and he's got to, like, oh, all yeah. of a sudden, like, go back to how he would normally act. Like, he doesn't just be like, leave me alone, my wife. He, he goes like, oh, hey, good to see you. Yeah, I'll be there. Like, and it's, it, it's like a constant thing in a lot of these scenes that he's got to do is, like, take a moment away from the French caper and, like, still glad handle the, the other doctors. Yeah, I love, love, love when he has to go even the other direct, a third direction and be, like, regular American guy, not like smart doctor American guy, but say things like man. And of course that whole drunk scene, we showed a little clip from at the top of the show, you know, where he's like, Hey man, who who are these dudes? Man, like like I am far out of left field for a doctor. (laughs) I love it. I love watching that. It was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Naked Harrison Ford. This is his first, this is the most naked Harrison Ford's ever been in a movie. (laughs) Yeah. He's just, just barely covered. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. With it looked like a Wookiee pelt. Let's see. (laughs) Because Ford plays it so stewing and then explodes yeah. a couple times towards the end vocally and then with fisticuffs, 
does the movie achieve it, its title? And it's okay if it doesn't, you know, but I, there was one famous quote Harrison Ford said he would have called the movie moderately disturbed. And I think that, like, <laughs> made Polanski go, come on. That's... He's not crazy in the movie. He's methodical and he's trying to figure it out and he's got to sort of maintain some demeanor. He'll be put away, you know, you never, if you go crazy in another country, you know, you, you never know what sort of forces of law you're going to come up against. He does allow it to build, though, over the court. Like, he begins, yeah. like, mildly concerned is, like, the first 30, 40 minutes, and there's a lot of shots of him just, like, looking around, and it's chaotic. But by the yeah. end, like, there is a shot. There's a lot of great extra, like, shocked extra work in this. Like, there's a lot of, like, <laughs> random French person on the street who's aghast at what he's seeing play out in front of him. And yeah. one of those great moments is there's, a you know, one of those outdoor French cafes where they're all sitting at their oh, tables yeah. drinking their wine. And Ford runs he's been blinded like he's been maced and so she's pulling him like we got to oh, get right. away run and they're running and he runs through a table like he just yeah. runs right like over it through it and a guy is like drinking a beer and <laughs> that just like knocks his beer the whole table goes flying and the man just sits there like looking like <laughs> confused by what's just happened it's a brilliant bit of extra work by that point he's frantic i think by that point he's running around like a crazy person it's genuinely unhinged i know the exact shot you're talking about because he, oh, he yeah. hung there for a long time with a table and all his food yeah. completely knocked out and away from him <laughs> without a major reaction yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Shot yeah. Exactly. It's, i love it it's a guy sitting at a table with another chair and harrison ford clears everything out but <laughs> yeah. him Maybe like that just... table and the other chair are just <laughs> blown apart from being dragged through it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah. It's probably not even Harrison Ford in that shot because we're only seeing him from behind. It's probably a stuntman jumping over, knocking over that table. I don't know. I'm curious now. I'd be curious to look at that again because I was shocked when that shot continued. As many shots in this movie do, they all continue a little bit extra than I think you would think another shot would be cut off. It's something yeah. interesting in the style, but that continues. They run into traffic. <laughs> like they <laughs> yeah, run yeah. And I'm like, hey, wait, was that Harrison Ford at the beginning of the shot? Did they just really run him into traffic? You know, Cars stop traffic? and yeah, they come close to getting hit. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a, it's a, curious uh, if that is him. All right. That shot is certainly frantic, but let's talk about that for a second, because there were some familiar names in the credits. Vic Armstrong, is mm -hmm. back to do stunts so and he oh. doubled for it a couple times so it could have been that shot or others probably on the roof oh, yeah. i would say uh from yeah. behind you know yeah vic's been the man for ford already and will continue to be up to the present really anthony powell who designed costumes for indiana jones and the temple of doom uh, is back for this to do the costume designing uh your editor is sam osteen who would eventually edit regarding henry and working girl both Mike Nichols films that involved Harrison Ford, but before that, Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf, Cool Hand Luke, The Graduate, Chinatown, big stuff, Sam Osteen, oh, wow. no joke. That's and awesome uh, produced by Tom Mount, who, speaking of the posters on my wall, I used to see his name all the time because he produced not only Frantic, but Natural Born Killers and Bull Durham. And I even had a Frankenstein Unbound poster on my yeah. wall, and he produced oh. that. So lots of familiar <laughs> names working on this thing, including a Robert Town uncredited rewrite. So, Oh, really? Oh, That's so. According to internet, and I'm going with it. That would make sense. I mean, he's very good at, like, the conspiracy, you know, like, I could see them bringing, bringing him in to, like, fine-tune, tighten the conspiracy, make it easier to follow, or some of those threads. I don't know. Yeah, because he's got this interesting way that he follows, because he's, again, not a superhero in this, he's just a regular guy. He finally opens the suitcase that was accidentally ended up in his room. You know, he finds a key with a blue parrot on it and then a matchbook with a phone number. You know, all the classic stuff to like, all right, call this number, go to this place, and which is right, what he yeah, does. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I wonder at what point somebody was like, nah, there needs to be a little more. The audience needs to be able to follow, you know, what's going on or unfold the plot with along with uh, Harrison Ford's character. Right, because he's doing a very amateur investigation where it's like, I've got one lead at a time, and I'm just going to like, okay, I've heard the name of this bar. We're going to go to that bar and see who we can meet. And like, okay, at that bar, I found this one guy. We're going to go to his apartment, you know? And it's like that very yeah. like one track sort of investigation. So I feel like, yeah, that's where a guy like Robert Town can come in and just make the world more colorful, make it feel like there's a lot of, you know, stuff going on behind some of these closed doors. Like, add to the web of intrigue, maybe. Make it more of a web. <laughs> I also wonder who added to the script things like when he wakes up in Emmanuel Signe's uh, apartment, there's a, a whole funk band rehearsing. Like, mm. like when he walks downstairs, there's a, a whole <laughs> yeah. band there just rehearsing. 
Is it a boat? Which is on a boat, yes. It's it a is. boat. Yeah. It's a house yeah. boat, right. But he doesn't give you any movie. If there's going to suddenly be a guy waking up on a houseboat, you get an establishing shot right, that he's yeah. on a boat. And we never get that shot. So I was like, are we not supposed to know this? is Because visually, this is a boat interior, I recognize. Yeah. Yeah. But... I feel like maybe we're not supposed to yeah. know they shot it on a boat. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you bring that up, Lon, because now this is kind of making me realize that this whole movie, a, a, a standard crutch that you would have a say of an establishing shot or, uh, you know, any, any sort of thing that sort of like gently glides you into the next thing. I think that's all been removed from this movie. Yeah. Like anything that could make you comfortable as an audience member, like an establishing shot or coverage. You know, a lot of times right. it's a one single take because it's you're sticking with him and you can only see right. what he can see. Exactly. You, know, you don't get any more information than he gets. I think that's a technique throughout this whole movie. Like, Oh, it certainly is. Yeah. You're always on your heels. You never are quite certain what part of the city you're in, how far, how long has it been? That's the other thing he does. This movie unfolds <laughs> over like two and a half days. But there's yeah. very rarely a sense for what time of day it is. And he yeah. screws with you a bunch where he'll set a scene and it's like we've had five scenes in a row. And so your brain just naturally assumes it's like afternoon. And then somebody will be like, should we get breakfast? Do you want to get a cafe au lait? It's 8.30 a.m. And you're like, wait a minute. How, how long has he been awake? How is it only 8.30 <laughs> yeah. a.m.? And I feel like they're doing that a bunch to just you're you're like Harrison Ford. You're always kind of. You're looking around. You're like, when is it? Where is it? Who am I looking for? Is it that person? Is it that person? Are they down that street? Like, you're always disoriented. And I think that's something unique to European filmmakers as well, because I remember, say, like in Godard's Weekend, they're in a traffic mm -hmm. jam, so he spends 10 minutes in a traffic jam because traffic jams are interminably long. So therefore, right. he has put you in the situation, you know? And so it's like putting us in Harrison Ford's situation takes a lot of different forms in this. Yeah. You know? Antonioni would be another great example. It's like the characters are so isolated. And so you're always shooting them from like far away or weird angles or like, where are they in relation to this other place? And it's like the the filmmaking purposefully causes you to get lost. And like, yeah. I think that's kind of what he's doing sometimes. Like Paris is so bewildering to this character and he wants to make it as bewildering to us, the viewers, so we can't get our bearings either. Yeah. 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 And it works. Some 70s filmmaking that Polanski's got you know pretty well established held over into the 80s i think you know not that he ever switched to like a super hyper present day type of filmmaking with quick cuts and all that stuff but it was good to see no, it in the middle of all the 80s movies you know there's some old school stuff going on yeah he's got a vintage chinatown shot too where you're shooting into the rear view mirror but you're like you're looking at the reflection oh. in the rear view mirror from a front facing shot which uh, nicholson does it in chinatown okay. and then ford does it again in this movie it's so disorienting you're looking in like two different directions at once basically wow yeah. and there's your robert town connection so it was easy to see oh, Polanski yeah. just give him a call let's talk about the score this is classic 80s morricone for oh, Ennio Morricone oh, yeah. wrote the score because he's it's definitely the guy who did the Untouchables, but it's definitely not the guy who did Days of Heaven. So it's eighties Morricone, I think, pretty through and through. Some great Bernard Herman style riffs, yeah. you know, like uh, in this thing, like the, it really ratchets up the suspense, and it's a really good score. It's yeah, yeah. I feel like Hitchcock was very much the conversation that he and Polanski yeah. had. It feels you know. like one of those Bernard Herman Hitchcock. Yeah. Scenes. Yeah, and he uh, does the credit roll at the beginning. It's funny. I just saw Tar yeah. for the first time, which is a spectacular movie. Oh, yeah. okay. And oh, the credits roll at the beginning. You know, for well, they yeah. don't roll. They actually do uh, you know, flash credits like they would at the end of the movie. I thought that was interesting. I said, oh, I just saw this in another film. The idea to get most of your credits out of the way. And then he still does a full scroll of credits at the end of the movie, too, yeah. in France. So. It's interesting. It's interesting. He's <laughs> definitely trying to get you into the some sort of, like, ease you into a mindset. And purposefully, the opening credits would take a really long time. And it's very, like, deliberate. Mm -hmm. And, like, he wants you to, like, settle down in your seat because we're going to we're gonna see Tar. It's like it feels very purposeful. Yeah. Like having an overture at the start of the movie or something. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, fitting for a conductor. Exactly. The words sort of come on Harrison, Warner Brothers presents Harrison Ford. They kind of start mm -hmm. close to screen and sort of fall back against the road right. like we're traveling. But then they, yeah, then they just, the music changes to like a an 80s <laughs> sort of beat and we just get the credits. I just thought that was very interesting to see someone make that choice. Well, and I think that sort of opening too, it's like, it's taking too long. We know it's taking too long, but what it's doing is when people see Paris for the first time, 
it's a long drive from the airport first. Like, <laughs> like it's like, it's not just beauty shot of Paris. It's like, no, I mean, as much like I was saying about that Godard analogy of like, Going to Paris, if you're visiting, is a lot of driving from the airport, and they do that, and then he gets a flat tire, and then they got to repair right. that, and you're like, well, that it that is almost like setting the stage for the whole rest of the movie. It's like there's always a task he's got to get done, but then like two annoying small things yeah. that have to get done before that task can get always. done, and it, it's like playing one of those <laughs> task oriented video games where it's constantly like, oh, you just need to go get the magic staff, like up, oh, but before you get to that, you got to go to the cave, up, oh, you can't get into the cave without a key, up, oh, you can't get the key until you fight this guy, <laughs> and it's like, and it, so the whole movie is really that, but it, it starts even before the kidnapping happens with, well, we got to get to the yeah. hotel, but up, oh, up oh, first we got this, we got the the you know reggae loving. Uh, cab driver has to change right. the flat tire up oh, his spare is also flat we got to wait for another cab up oh, now we're stuck behind this uh garbage truck so it's just like he's setting the stage for us being frustrated and, and unable to sort of finish the task even before the thriller element is introduced yeah in a way that has nothing to do with anything that's going to happen for this the movie he needed to do what I did when I, when my day of errands wasn't going well. It's just the Miyagi. You clap. You do the, if he did that right after the flat tire thing, his energy would have changed. Everything would have been fine. They would have gotten the right suitcase. By the way, yeah. we have to all love the wife's disappearance scene. Handled so well. Oh. The shot from inside the shower. The garbled yeah. dialogue. Then just gone. No, like, exciting kidnapping moments. No, no. Uh, anything yeah. like that. They just also gone he doesn't do the thing that every thriller does which is show you ford's imagination like even the fugitive they do that where we see seal award like like being grabbed or yelling yeah. or like these flashes of him imagining what might have happened and like that that's such a trope like such a tired sort of trope and plansky does none of that it's just she's gone and it's like she was never even there the lady vanishes yeah and once again it's one of those long takes which are throughout this whole thing and when you've got a long take it forces the audience to start looking around the frame a little bit. And and that's exactly what happens there. It's Ford in the foreground, the shower door, the door to the, the bathroom, and then the room outside there. And as it slowly moves in, like nothing happening, just nothing happening. And just his wife doing stuff. And then you see that a suitcase get dragged out of the door frame. And that's the last of that shot. That is all that you get. It's kind of amazing, really. Yeah, I mean, he's training you to, like, you're going to spend this whole movie scanning the background, looking for the things in the background that Harrison Ford doesn't notice because it starts yeah, there training where it. he's not looking at her. He's looking us to the side. We're yeah. seeing her and Ford isn't. So we're immediately start looking for clues that he missed. Like, who's she talking to? What are they talking about? What's her demeanor like when she's on the phone? Like, And so the rest of the movie, we're doing that because he's trained us in that scene to start doing it. I think. Yeah, right. Like, as soon as he goes down to the lobby and he's looking in the bar and he's looking over here, it's like, who's over there? Who's over there? We're trying to, like, solve, you know, you're trying to Benoit Blanc it in real time, even though, you know, you can't at that point. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's a verb already. <laughs> yeah. To, to Blanc something. Kind of a rare style of directing. I feel like we don't see every day, but, uh, you know, I don't see it as many movies as I should, but. I think we've we've lost some of this because just as a director, your confidence that people are paying close visual attention to a scene that they'll notice stuff in the background i feel like we're starting to lose and that filmmakers realize that people are a little distracted maybe on their phone like we should maybe have more of this in dialogue or we should maybe hit that beat twice instead of just once to like make sure people definitely notice it and i think that oh, you don't God. have filmmakers who have the confidence in their viewers that you had in God. the 70s and 80s yeah. do they teach directing for streaming now do you think that's part of like <laughs> curriculums just like hey know that people are watching this at home the doorbell could ring so they just sit you down and watch the gray man yeah yeah, I think it's intuitive for a lot of younger directors at this point. They recognize that, like, okay, you know, people don't necessarily watch things with that level of intense focus that I can just throw them a little stuff. I mean, I know, you think you notice it on social media all the time where people will be trying to criticize or pick apart a recent movie, and it's like, your criticism is 100% answered in this movie. You just didn't notice right. the part. Like, there was a big one about, like, why does Janelle Monet drink the hard kombucha in Glass Onion? She knows that it's hard kombucha. It's like, she's not there in the scene where he tells them that it's hard kombucha. Right. So, yeah. your problem is actually answered in the film, sir. Yeah, I think that if, even if I, I, I'm not a director, but if I was, I, I would even probably bear that in mind. That, like, eh, maybe have a character mention this twice instead of just once. 
Wow. In case people wow. are. Criticism of some Marvel movies is, is when I hear people state something that they think is an observation that nobody in the movie knows, but there's a, a moment where they do discuss what sure. the person is claiming was never discussed in the movie. And you're like, oh, you just saw it once. I know those movies are packed with info, but right. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's well, in there. Yeah. It's seeing it once. And it's also like, I think that, and I, I don't mean to like blame it. Like people don't have any attention span. Like this isn't an old guy bashing Gen Z or whatever. I don't think it's any of our fault. Like I watch movies less closely than I used to. It's happening to everybody. It's just cultural. Like it, it's also part of theaters. Like I used to see a lot more in the theater and now I see more on my couch and you're just more distracted when you're on your couch. So I think, yeah, like that, the intense focus that people used to have when they watched movies, I think is not necessarily a thing. So it's harder to make a movie like this where it's totally dependent yeah. on visuals and observing things in the background of being like that kind of a active viewer. Never again will anybody be able to make a movie in which they are 100% confident that everyone watching it will be able to watch it all the way through. That's gone. You know, so you could make your movie for people that are going to be there the entire time, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that's just, that's part of filmmaking now that you just have to like, you know, we'd linger on some of these shots longer, these details, or we'd zoom in, or you'd have somebody mention something so that the audience is kind of brought along with you instead of just relying on them to like, they'll notice it, they'll see that there. Any other thoughts you have, please chime in, but I'm going to just throw a few more facts down here for sort of some final thoughts. First of all, it's an old mm -hmm. movie. How do we know? They flew TWA. <laughs> uh, I also feel like if you were doing this today, the bad guys are generic, like they're from a Middle Eastern country. There are these Arab guys, but we don't know anything else about them. In 88, you could totally get away with that kind of shorthand. They were like, it was like the Soviets. You could just like, they're the bad guys, right. you know? I think today you would address that a little more. They're not just generic from another country. They're rogue agents. They're, they're from quantum. They're trying to revive the Soviet empire, right? They're quantum. They're, they're international <laughs> terrorists posing as you, you, you'd sugarcoat it a little bit. They're tech giants, right? That's the new bad guy too. Oh yeah. They'd yeah. Be right. They'd be working for <laughs> Bezos or something. Yeah. Here's your taglines. They've taken his wife. Now he's taken action. So Adam, your recap is, yeah, that's about it in a sentence. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the one that was on my poster was danger desire desperation oh. each with a period playing up the he doesn't really see the girl emmanuel however you pronounce her name like she's kind of almost pursuing him or flirty with him in a way that he is not with her but i feel like that tagline is sort of playing up the like ooh, desire like he's he's on an exactly. adventure with a young sexy woman and it's like that's not really how he sees it but it is interesting how they get that in there that those two having you know physical closeness the reasons for that throughout the movie yeah. you know, are not because he wants to have sex with her or she wants to have sex with him, you know, but it is interesting. They do get intimate. They dance at a club. He's naked in her bed. Like, yeah, the, they're right. The reasons the for it are not, you know, anything sexy. <laughs> it's like, it's all utilitarian. <laughs> yeah. They're definitely playing around with it. And then there is this odd moment at the very end when he has rescued his wife and uh, he's taking out the bad guys or whatever. And she's kind of left to care for this dying girl that he brought with him and like yeah. in the moment the wife has no idea who this woman is You're like why my husband is now traveling around <laughs> paris with this like 20 something yeah he's got a new assistant like it, it must be so perplexing to her in that moment like who's this dying girl you brought maybe she even leaned into well it's perry you know it might. Yeah, it's maybe my husband you know. but it's the city of lights what you got? somebody just hands her a lit cigarette and a glass of wine he's like eh, you are in perry my friend <laughs> 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 look the part look the part yeah, you got everybody in the movie well, that, that is interesting when he has to pretend he's having an affair in order to because he makes a, an interesting divergence here you know he goes to the cops he goes to the embassy but then at some point when he has more information than they do he decides on his own no i can't involve them i now have to lie to them right because i've got the line on this and so when they catch him with the girl and he goes come on has paris changed so much turn a blind eye here <laughs> like yeah. he does that whole thing and the guy's like oh oh yeah yeah sorry no i won't say anything but yeah that's how I, he gets, I think, the, gets away from him. yeah <laughs> dr walker i Hope you know what you are doing. Yeah, he, he shames the French guys into being more approving of extramarital affairs. Like, right. oh, I thought I was in Paris. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, oh, no, you are in Paris. You are in Paris. Oh, no, no, no. You're in Paris. You're Have in sex Paris. with every sorry, prostitute, sorry, sorry, sorry. sir. Oh. 
<laughs> it's totally what he does. He's like, come on, has Paris changed so much? Oh, no, no, no. no. It's yeah, like same. that's it's how you same. that's how you insult a French guy. You're like, I'm not allowed to uh, cheat on my wife here all of a sudden? Are you right. <laughs> what kind of Paris is this? Oh, so sorry, sir. So sorry, sir. Our mistake. Uh, I was just going to say, it's delightful that this movie is set in France and we can make fun of their accents. If this was... Oh, you're right. This was, if this was like right. a Japanese movie, three white <laughs> no, you dudes, can't, uh, no, you can't right out. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. Yes, it's one of the few accents we can make fun of. I still. love That's, being able to go. Oh, 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 nobody can be like that guy. That's yeah. right. Everybody's like, oh, come on, man, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. well, it was 2022. We could. Sorry, do that French then. guys. <laughs> Everything like that, I, I say to myself, I go, it was 2022. We could do that back then. Because <laughs> I just know someday yeah. we won't be able to. <laughs> Listen, I'm still writing 2022 on all my checks and offensive jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of offensive uh, jokes, Polanski. So, mm. if you don't know, ah. he was accused of sexual uh, rape. I rape, screw yeah. It. Sexual, uh, with sexual rape. Year-old. I think that's I what they call it, Paul. If you want to use the legal term, <laughs> sexual I think it's at this point, rape. I don't even know. Do we really need to say accused, alleged? It, it, it's basically. Yeah, well, I mean, he's, he left the country so that he would never get a trial. And so that's yeah. why, if you want to make a movie with Roman Polanski, you got to go to France. You do and it in so France. So it seemed like Ford, you know, in his effort to be with good directors, went to Paris. In case anyone didn't know the little fun fact about Roman. Yeah, he drugged and sexually assaulted a woman at Jack Nicholson's Girl. house. You know that last part's oh. not often said. Yeah, a th- I, she was she was thirteen or fourteen. He got at away the time too. It's a notable. Yeah. She's a young young girl. Yep, yep. He brought her over to Jack Nicholson's house. And yeah, then Jack that. Nicholson's house. <laughs> and we love Jack. Don't we love Jack? What a what a clean actor he is, huh? Yeah. Listen, a lot, <laughs> it's a lot of stories, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Go back and read some books. There's lots of books about all this. Right. <laughs> it's like how Chris Walken was on the boat when Natalie Wood. The people don't talk about that one either. Don't talk about that one either. <laughs> you know who else was on that boat? Who else was your on boy, that boat? Your boy Chris Walken, everybody's favorite. Dancing, dancing Whoa. Chris Walken. She went over the side. I I was sleeping. I didn't hear a thing. Remember that time that John Belushi OD'd right after hanging out with Robin Williams? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, did we forget that last part? We forgot, yeah. Chateau. (laughs) Well, rest in peace to both of them now. Hey, remember when uh, Betty Buckley couldn't make the Eight is Enough uh, family reunion movie because she was shooting (laughs) Frantic? Yeah. That might be a new fact for a lot of people, but anyway, that that happened. How dare she? My God. Well, I insist all my facts be fun. Thank you, Paul. That's, uh... yeah. How long would she even have to be on set for Frantic? I feel like she could have knocked this out oh, yeah. in two days. So I know, right? You got to arrive in Paris and then leave Paris. What else are you doing? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she had to go to the hotel, the car, and then that Statue of Liberty at the end there. And that she, yeah. that's, that's her day. Barely. She's not running around the whole city on rooftops. No. By the way, Le Grand Hotel is real. So next, you know, with my obsession with movie locations, Ooh. you can expect photos from there next time I'm in Paris. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. However, do you think Polanski was so serious about this that he actually, just for this fair similitude, had Betty Buckley kidnapped for three weeks while they shot everything else? <laughs> yeah, that, that phone I call don't... where he talks to her on the phone, she was really being held in an undisclosed location. Yeah. Just for the realism, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, how about this? The aftermath of Frantic. Is there a Best Actor nomination for Harrison Ford that got overlooked? Uh, I'd have to see who was nominated that year. But who, yeah, I'd have to look at the rest of 88 in film. Uh, I mean, I, he's he's very good here. I don't know if it's, like, the best performance. Like I, I'm, like, deeply insulted that he wasn't Oscar nominated for it. But it's, he's good. It's a good performance. Yeah, because he's on his run now with the two Peter Weir films, and he was nominated for Witness. Uh, here's who was nominated. Dustin Hoffman wins for Rain Man. Gene Hackman in Mississippi Burning, perhaps one of the greatest performances of all time. Yeah. Tom Hanks in Big, Edward James oh. Olmos in Stand and Deliver, and Max von Sydow in Pele the Conqueror. There's probably no room I for Harrison Ford. Tom on that Hanks list. was nominated yeah. for Big. Tom Hanks in Big is another like it's good. I don't know if it's like the crown jewel of Tom Hanks performances. Like I could Dude. see flipping that one out for Ford in this one. I'm with you on that line, but America, I don't think they're on board with Yeah, you. Americans were not on board. They loved <laughs> that big movie. No, no, but I, I think they never thought that Tom Hanks would expand beyond his early roles, right. that he would never have a dramatic performance, so that this was as dramatic as Tom Hanks was ever really going <laughs> to yeah. get. And yeah. yet he was somehow able to play man-child on a higher acting professional level uh, than he had early on. And and I think they thought that was as good as Tom Hanks was ever going to get. And I mean, that's, even thinking you know, about it as a performance, I feel like he's playing too young for a lot of that movie. Like, he's supposed to be, what, 13, 14 in an adult's body? And sometimes yeah. it feels more like 8 to 10. 
thin, thin, thin. I don't know if they always get the age calibration. <laughs> a very pointed critique. Exactly That's right. Good point. If I'm looking back and being about honest that. about it. And the Jack it. Nicholson thing. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting reverse of the usual. We talk about the critical response to this movie. Critics liked it, but no one went. You know, we've just been on a run of these blockbusters where critics were, you know, back and forth and iffy on a lot of his bigger movies, but they made millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. Jonathan Rosenbaum, Adam, always like checking out ah, Jonathan Rosenbaum, Jonathan Chicago Rosenbaum. reader critic. Mm. Polanski's usual surrealism is almost completely absent. Yeah. Different kind of movie, Jonathan, you dumbass. I know. Anyway. Well, well, yeah, it's not a supernatural <laughs> Did you want it's some repulsion a... hands coming out? I forget it. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, like, the Tenon, he's like, that. that's a Descent into Madness movie. That's not what this is. This Where is were the three witches? The yeah. Kidnapping, yeah, movie. like, I don't... I've been calling this the Susan Sarandon rule. The Susan Sarandon rule is you can't criticize every movie that doesn't have Susan Sarandon in it for its lack of Susan Sarandon. Maybe they didn't <laughs> want to put her in that movie. Yeah. She is and not, is I thing. should note, not in frantic, Susan Sarandon. Not in frantic, yeah. not it's the all. main Doesn't problem. Yeah. I was hoping to see <laughs> Susan Sarandon, so this movie sucks. What, what, could that be the baggage like, I brought in? That's why I didn't <laughs> like the Sandlot. Yeah, good point. <laughs> it's like, but Polanski made other non-surreal movie. Dude, like, he's made multiple films set in objective reality. I don't. The movie I, he did before this is Pirates, isn't it? Yeah. I, I was going to say, yeah, weird, that was right before It's a weird this. comment. Big, it's a weird one. Big return to form for him yeah. coming off of that movie. <laughs> the uh, underplayed performance by Ford is coupled with a decidedly Don LaFontaine-esque trailer. Take a listen. No one will believe him. I hope you know what you're doing, Dr. Walker. Listen. And only one person in Paris can help him. My wife. My wife. She's about to lead him. You will get your wife, I'll get my money, and everybody will be happy. Into a world as mysterious as she is. Stop lying to me. Now! Hmm. Yeah, they're really playing up the desire, like he meets a dangerous yeah. woman who leads right. him into the <laughs> darkness. You know, and it's like that's really not the move. Like they never really give him even a moment of feeling like, oh, am I developing feelings for this woman? But I'm looking for my wife. Like he doesn't feel at all torn between yeah, these two women. No, at any point. yeah, but it's so in a world, in a yeah. world, <laughs> in a web of intrigue, in a world where Harrison Ford no longer talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They never go with the affair, uh, or like with Emmanuel Seigne. Like the, no. he, he doesn't try and get on her. She doesn't try to get on him. I think and they're also, worried it might turn us on him. Like if the, you know his wife is in this dire situation, if he right. even acts attracted to her, we're going to be like you bastard, you know. But he also never assumes that she is gone because of an affair or anything like that. Like that is just not even an issue. I think there's one scene that. He emotes like, oh, she might have been having an affair. That's only that one scene. And, and then it's never discussed again. So it's like any of those sort of things just, no, it's it's all about the suspense. He doesn't entertain seriously the idea. And I think that to me that's part of like the sort of the European versus the American. Like like Americans are, it's black and white. It's like, nope, she's gone. I'm the victim of a violent crime. All of you must help me. And the Europeans are like, well, let's give it a few days and see what happens. <laughs> who, who's to say, you know? Why don't we chill? Cut to 2003. Harrison Ford is presenting Best Director uh, for the 2002 movies at the Oscars. As from the very beginning, when all the arts and sciences of motion pictures bring movies to life, it is the director who gives them their pulse. And here are the nominees for the 75th Achievement in Directing. For Chicago, Rob Marshall. For Gangs of New York, Martin Scorsese. For The Hours, Stephen Daldry. For The Pianist, Roman Polanski. For Talk to Her, Pedro Almodovar. And the Oscar goes to Roman Polanski. For the pianist. He wasn't there. <laughs> Roman yeah. wasn't there. He no would have shot. been arrested at the airport. Not allowed. <laughs> yeah, the district attorney was outside the theater like, 
<laughs> just According in case. to research, it looks like Ford flew to d- Paris to deliver the... Uh, no, I'm oh, sure, wow. sure he didn't fly himself, oh. but he flew uh, to deliver the Oscar to Polanski himself. So they, they, they connected, yeah. I guess. And... I mean, there can be no doubt that this great director who is being awarded for his directing in another movie that is directed good made terrible mistakes early on in his career. I don't know if that changes how he and Harrison Ford got along and he got a long standing ovation after he won. I could have let the clip play, but we, you know, we got to you can't go forever on the show. You get a long and then the slowly standing ovation from Hollywood. He's a really fascinating case because what we know about what he did has yeah. not changed significantly during like even my lifetime. I mean, we're no. talking about decades where everyone who's paying attention, who knows the name Roman Polanski knows what he's accused of, what he did. It's basically out in the open. He he managed yeah. to evade justice, but not us finding out what happened. So right. we're only ever seeing the change in how people process and react to this news. He hasn't done anything different. It's no. just how the industry is deciding to view people like him and treat people like him. That's what's changing. No, obviously he straightened up his act too. His films don't even come out in America anymore. Like he and Woody Allen are, I think, these two big examples of iconic filmmakers whose personal behavior did not change. And yet our view of them changed so much that we've now stopped releasing their films in this country entirely. Their personal behavior changed in that he doesn't continue to, you know. Uh, no, I mean the thing that the thing that they're accused of doing. Right, the, the actual fact. We didn't get new information. Right. I don't. I have no personal perspective on how they've changed as people. I'm. I'm just saying, like, the allegations are static. Right. It's the attitude toward the allegations and how we correct how we deal with those people in a long term way. That's the thing that's changed. And I'm not saying yeah. good or bad. Like, listen, no, no. I leave that to all of you. I'm. Sure. Uh, I'm just saying that that's the thing that we are seeing in a different way now. It's like you can't, you, 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 Hollywood would no longer give Roman Polanski a standing ovation. No. No matter how good the film is in No, he would not get a nomination. <laughs> okay, so this is 22 movies. So let's might as well jump to the Harrison Ford punch count. We've been keeping a track uh, of his career punches. Sure. Lon, sure. what do you think? 22 movies in, how many times has he punched a guy or a girl or anybody? Wow, uh, so we're movie? talking, I mean, he's got a couple. Punch Barbara Bach. He's got he's got two indie films yeah. under his under his belt at this point, so those are those are punch heavy. So I feel like that's going to tilt the total. Oh, hilarious! Uh, I, just, I thought you meant independent, but go ahead. Fifty-five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ooh, not bad. Is he close? The two in Frantic makes seventy. Oh, okay. I was a little. Low. I mean, Temple of Doom at thirty-nine alone. So. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is those indie movies really? <laughs> it's a lot of punching, and they're all those very forceful, heavy sound effect. Thwack punches, you know, like yeah. when Indy punches a guy, they feel oh. it. Do it, Paul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. That's an Indy punch. Yeah. I don't even know what part of the body makes that sound when struck. But, yeah. Evidently, it's a stack of leather jackets and a baseball bat is what actually makes oh, that wow. sound effect. I had no idea. Ben Bert, you genius. Paul, I have to ask this. Lon, do you know the very first person that Harrison Ford punched on screen? <laughs> We were so excited to find out when did he start punching people because we started yeah. at the very beginning. It's like Force 10 from Navarone or one of those movies I'm not remembering as clearly. I don't think I know this one. That would be the best guess, actually, because I have a feeling he only punches one person once before Force 10. Right, Paul? Uh, I believe I got that right. Force 10 was uh, three punches. Yeah. 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 First person he ever punches on screen is in the movie Love, uh, 1968, 69, I think. And this stars uh, Peter Falk and Elaine May wow. and uh, Jack Lemon. And the very first person Harrison Ford ever punches on screen is Jack Lemon. That's crazy. <laughs> what a weird. It just, you don't think of them as the same, like, generation of stars. No. So it's a little, like, you're picturing Harrison Ford punching an old Jack Lemon, which is what yeah. it's so, <laughs> Like, grumpy old men Jack Lemon. And, like, no, no, it was, uh, it was more acceptable. Said, why did, what did I, what did I, 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 this guy is punching me in the face. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> What's so funny about it is, Unlike any other punch where it's like action, this is one that completes the joke of Jack Lemon being hapless, where even a stranger will punch him in a, oh, in okay. a bad day. So that's what's kind Fair of fun enough. About yeah. 
and true to your guess, uh, there were no other punches in a movie until Force 10. So he doesn't punch okay. anybody in Star Wars or American Graffiti or The Conversation. Yeah, no, I knew Star Wars was Gene a no. Hackman. Yeah, I knew Star Wars was punch free. That was I was yeah. starting from there. He only punches once in the whole trilogy. Yeah, more more of a negotiator. So then to the Harrison Ford list of essentials, righteous anger. Yes, he has stewing righteous anger this Ooh. whole movie. And by the time he Boils. yells with an S for shithead, that's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's let everything go at that point. Yeah. And then does he point? I counted him, Adam. Did you count him? I did, but I kind of lost count. My count, I think, was like nine or ten. I think I'm under on that. What did you get, Paul? I got six. Oh, did you get six? When he tries to convince Mahoney his wife was kidnapped, John Mahoney playing one of the American yeah. reps in France, he says, I have your suitcase. He points, take oh, your okay. fingers out of your face and drive us to the airport. He said, tells that to, uh, <laughs> to Dopey yeah. Emmanuel at one point. We have the one when he was naked that you mentioned. He proposes the exchange in the nightclub. The bad guy ends up punching there in that clip we showed. He right. says, I'll meet you at the blah, 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 blah. And then my wife first when he's actually at the exchange. Those are the six that I got. Pretty decent. Yeah, here, I pulled two of these. Yeah, this one's great. You go now! Don't mess with me, man. I am an American, and I am crazy. Ah, it's a great point. But yeah, this is the one of the movie right here. My wife first! Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, that it? commanding, when just the finger pops into frame, yeah. A point and shout, we should say. And it's a physical gesture of what he's saying. So uh, it's a different, uh -huh. it's an interesting point. It's also a one first. So last question, then we got to wrap this up. How Harrison Ford is he in this percentage one? Oof. It builds. I feel like it in the builds. beginning, you're not at a very high level of Fordism, no. but by the third act, it's a very Harrison Ford movie. Right. I like it as a companion piece to The Fugitive. It feels like two different sort of kind of variations on a similar idea, yeah. and they both build yeah. to a, a, an intense level of Fordism by the end. Dr. Richard Walker. And they're both Dr. Richards, yeah. Yeah. 85%? Oh, that's Is giving that a it a number? lot. I would that's say 80. I would feel like 80%, 80%? by the end. By the, by the third act when he's like punching guys and jumping into them and like uh, doing hostage exchanges. Yeah, that feels pretty yeah. nice for him. So, I mean, find yes. a middle ground. If, if he's 90 right. later and he's like yes. 60 early, then maybe like 75. Yeah, I think that sounds fair. I'd probably say he gets up to 80% total in the movie, but at the first half hour of the movie is 0%. And then the second <laughs> half hour of the movie is like 30%. So I think I'm going to come in more around like uh, 65 on this one, 70, you know, uh, just as an average. That's it. We have done our work. Lon Harris, as ever, you're a Thank joy you, and a delight. Oh, and uh, yeah. always bring a good perspective. And again, follow Lon at Lon's. Is, are you there on Instagram as well or just Twitter? Yeah, Lon, Lon Harris on Instagram, my full okay. name, because I couldn't, I didn't get in early enough to get a four, a four letter uh, name on that one. Just Twitter. Somebody beat you to Lon's? Yeah. Four, I mean, any four letter combo on any big social media platform is hard to get. It's just because in 2007, I was working at a tech startup and my boss went to South by Southwest and came back and was like, you guys should all check out this app they just showed me. It's called Twitter. And like it was just before it had gone mainstream at all. Uh, so that's that's the only way I lucked into oh, a wow. four letter name. It was just pure coincidence. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that was a minimum or a. Yeah. No, I think three is the minimum. It's just they all get oh. taken right away. So uh, yeah, that's how you end up you. with like first name bunch of numbers is the, yeah, the, yeah. the Twitter go to because all the four letter versions get locked up. Anything else to plug? Nah, that's fine. Follow me on Twitter. Oh, oh, yeah. One more thing. <laughs> My podcast with Hal Rudnick that we do yes. every few weeks where we just watch a bunch of stuff on streaming services and then yak at each other about it. It's called Binge Boys. You can find that anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. And it saves me so much time from watching some of those shows. I just listen to what Lon thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Lon, thank you so much. And that wraps the Ford Fiesta for 1988. Wait, he did another movie in 1988, and we'll talk about it in the next show. Whoa, Ford's quite the working guy. <laughs> Paul, funny you should put it that way. You'll go now! Don't mess with me, man. I am an American, and I am crazy.